from New Zealand but I I'm also from I'm from the Pacific I'm an islander too <laughs> I'm living at the moment in Masterton in the Wairarapa in New Zealand and I moved there after living for 17 years in Kiribati on Tarawa and in my comings and goings between uh, Tarawa and New Zealand or Tarawa and Australia I used to pass through Fiji and being a Baha'i, I would, you know, contact the Baha'i community and I became friends with uh, Nelemba. And that's how the interest began in our collaborative art project, through visiting Lemba and seeing the work in her house and asking her, who did this? <laughs> and she said, I do. And um, I started getting some ideas about working, us working together. Our name of our working together now, it's a new garden, or Te Te Wo in Fiji, Te Te Wo, a new garden. The meaning of the piece of uh, kapa that we've been making, it's about we coming together, uh, the oneness of mankind. When I was traveling backwards and forwards, I would often find myself in the transit lounge at Nandi Airport. And um, in the transit lounge are these magnificent examples of Fijian tapa, very fine tapa. And uh, I used to look at these things and think, wow, I, I'd love to know about how they're made and if ever there was a possibility of finding someone who was happy to work with me, I'd really love to learn and spend time with that person or those people working together. As uh, Lemma described, we, we work together in New Zealand but um, I used to come through here, you know, I continued coming through here regularly and uh, sooner after completing our work in New Zealand, I was at a, a gathering, a Baha'i gathering in um, Suva and that's where I met Mbale and we were talking about the work that we had just completed and how I, I really was keen to do some more work. It started off with uh, an invitation to, to put a proposal forward to the um, Queensland Art Gallery for possible inclusion in the Asia Pacific Triennial. We, we sort of developed some ideas around the idea of Lautoka City being Sugar City. One of the alternative names for Lautoka is Sugar City because there are four sugar mills in Fiji and the largest one is in Lautoka. So sugar, the idea of sugar, took on a, a symbolic meaning. That idea of sweetness, of the the, the sweetness of, of, of a, a, a relationship which is, which is based on love, on, on respect, um, a kindness. relationship which is, yes, and kindness and harmony. And, uh, and then out of that develop, you know, this idea of, of a city, <laughs> mm -hmm. of a place, a place where we can come together and recognise our oneness our essential unity. So the concept of place shifted from Lautoka to Mount Carmel, which for Baha'is is symbolic of a, um, a, a meeting place, a, a point of unity, of coming together, out of which radiates that which is the, the cause of unity.
our team, us three girls, we started working uh, early in December. Okay. We worked together, consulting as we went. We, you know, the work really grew. It, uh, so it's it's interesting looking at it and thinking, how did we, how did we arrive at this? It's miraculous in some ways. We felt conceptually it was really a gift um, to us, really, and that we needed to honour that gift by uh, exerting ourselves to produce something of the, the highest quality that we could. I was really attracted by the, the kind of tapa that is produced here in Fiji, especially the fine work that comes from Mordi. And it was, it was, it was wonderful um, meeting up with Lemba and then with Mbali and being able to work with them. I just cherish this, uh, this thought that um, I really like to, to, to learn and find out what it's like working with those kinds of materials. And the other thing that I find attractive is working um, collaboratively with people who are from a different kind of um, background, you know, and finding that middle ground, you know, working, I call it working in the space between. The space between cultures, the space between um, the kind of traditions that we're familiar with, and learning how to operate in that, in that space between. Because in a sense, that's, I think, in a, in a way where all of us are being drawn to having to learn that, how to function in a world where mm, people of very different backgrounds are coming together and having to learn how to, to work together. The kind of training that I've had is very different from the sort of training that um, Lembra and Bali had. Um, but the interesting thing is that when you, when you go deeper into uh, the nature of the work that we do, whether it's tapa or whether it's painting, for example, you find that the, the basic principles, aesthetic principles, are exactly the same. That's been one of the very interesting things that I've learned mm. working, working together. My auntie taught me how to make tapas, mm. starting from beating the tapa, and uh, most of the tapa she made, I have to learn from her. It's about the tapa that uh, our chief usually use. Okay, very fine. Huh? Very mm. fine, very, very, very fine, fine tapa. Mm. First of all, we learned tapa from the school, the time, mm. uh, when the time of the handicraft, mm. and the time the teacher said, this is the time of the handicraft, so we have to beat the tapa mm. in the school. Is that primary school? Primary school. Oh, right. And one lady supposed to come every Wednesday to teach us at school. So in that time I learned uh, tapa from the school. I went to um, intermediate school at Epsom. It was called Epsom Normal. <laughs> and I distinctly remember arriving there and being extremely excited by the thought of a whole room dedicated to art. And this was a school that had an art room and an art teacher. Wow, this was something, you know, because I don't, I don't, I, I don't know how I started at that age. Um, I would have been, say, eleven. But even at that age, at eleven, I was already interested in images uh, and drawing. I must have been because I was so. I, I just loved that feeling of the art room. I did the requisite course of study and um, was accepted into Elam School of Art. And then I remember arriving at this art school first day and it was just wonderful I felt that I after all the somewhat slightly lonely years always feeling you know a little bit odd I was, I was different suddenly here I was with this bunch of people they just seemed like my brothers and sisters it was like discovering my family it was fantastic you know the close friends that I have all date back to that time so they were the golden years, the three years at art school, and I can remember distinctly the day then I decided I, I wanted to um, 
major in painting because painting seemed the most mysterious and difficult thing to, to grapple with. You know? how, to, how to render something uh, with space and volume and weight and tone and all those sort of different elements on a flat surface just seemed really intriguing. And as an artist working in New Zealand, I, you know, the, the, the land is, has this, what's often called an iconic presence. And the, the, lands, the land and the features of the land uh, uh, stand in for the, the human presence. When I left New Zealand and went to live in Kiribati, that was no longer a viable option for, um, um, you know, in, in searching for the, 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 the visual language in order to present one's ideas, uh, there's very little land to, to speak of. <laughs> and so people um, became prominent and the social condition in which those, those people operated. And then in 1996, we, we had a, a, a fire, which uh, destroyed our house and my studio and everything in it. And uh, so that was an interesting experience. <laughs> you know, Bahá'u'lláh, in his writings, makes this interesting statement in the context of other things, but he says, my calamity is my providence. Mm. So thinking, you know, this, this calamity became providential, if that's the correct word. Mm. It gave me an opportunity, or it actually pushed me towards making a decision I should have really made a long time ago, and that was to look around me and work with what was immediately available. Because after the fire, I had no other option. Right? I was compelled to uh, work with the locally available materials, which uh, happened to be pandanus leaf, and the skills of weaving. And since I don't have any skill for weaving, it required me to learn how to work collaboratively with others. And that was just the most wonderful discovery, the joy of working in collaboration with others. Especially when the, the, the people that you're working with uh, you know, they have skills that you, you, you respect and, and who themselves, you know, they understand quality and they, they're committed to it. And so together, the whole idea that I, that I learned about collaboration was that through, through working with others, you can create something that you could never do on your own. And the process has to include uh, trust and consultation. You have to learn about each other and, and trust one another. Uh, that's what I've learned about collaboration and why I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, uh, and so that, that led to um, a preference for two things since that event in Kiribati. One is looking for opportunities to work with others. The second is um, the requirement that the materials that I work with have to in some way have relevance to what I'm saying. You know, if it's oil on canvas, then what's the point? 
what's, what's the point of the oil and the canvas? So that the materials are not just conveying an idea, they are part of the idea. Sometimes I'm asked, you know, what, 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 how, what do you identify with? Because, you know, my um, father is uh, part Māori and my mother's um, Pākehā, so I guess I had that sort of mixed um, background I was pretty much aware of. I remember at one point being asked, you know, well, who, what, what part of you do, I, do you identify with, you know, Pākehā or, or Māori? It was an interesting question and I thought about it and thought, really, my core, if I was to say, what is my core culture? It is Baha'i, Baha'i faith. Um, because being a Baha'i is not just um, a belief and then, you know, it really is a culture in so much as becoming a Baha'i requires you to develop certain habits uh, and certain attitudes which, uh, you know, you, you take everywhere. There are certain things that the Baha'i community worldwide has achieved that are unique in the history of this planet, in the history of human beings on this planet. Uh, for example, we now function as a global community and I cannot imagine a more diverse community than the Baha'i community worldwide because Baha'is are represented in well over 200 countries um, and within each country there are in many cases very a number of different ethnic groupings so it's an extremely diverse family and yet we all recognize one central point of reference in terms of the administration of Baha'i communities everywhere, the way in which we organize ourselves, the basic concepts that inform our daily lives and our attitudes towards each other and towards humanity, in terms of the pathway that we follow for deepening our knowledge and advancing our skills to be able to serve humanity. For example, Baha'is worldwide uh, are now engaged in a single curriculum of study. When you become a Baha'i, what do you become? You know, what, what is this really about? You know, what does it mean? My understanding is that really becoming a Baha'i means becoming someone who is developing skills to serve the needs of humanity. That, that's essentially what it is. To become um, an effective agent for change for the better. You know, whether that functions, whether you're functioning at, at, a, at a village level uh, or, or in a big city, in, in big institutions or in small villages, that's not the point. In the end, it involves, what Baha'is are engaged in, involves individuals worldwide who are all addressing the needs of humanity right now and providing for the education of children, spiritual and moral education of children, providing for the um, empowerment, the spiritual empowerment of junior youth, that very special age group from 12 to 15, raising the, the spiritual um, consciousness of their friends and neighbors through engaging in gatherings at which prayers are said and the Word of God is, is read and meditated on. Studying material which develops their spiritual insights, confers added knowledge, and gives them skills to be able to carry out activities that are, are going to help them become children's class teachers or uh, someone who can work with junior youth or someone who can take others along a path of service. If I think of who, who are the members of my community, they are everyone within, with whom I come in contact with. My neighbours, my friends, their friends, family. Um, that, that is a, a whole different idea of community. It's, it's a great privilege to be able to work with people who are thinking in this way and who have a, um, a vision of where humanity is heading. You know, there are so many troubling things going on. What, what is destined for us? 
You know, these, are, these are important questions. I feel a lot of people are, um, are trying to sort of understand these difficult questions. And if one does have a sense of vision of where we're going, it's not a cause for complacency or self-righteousness at all. What it does do is it confers a real sense of responsibility and the urgency. Um, you know, one becomes aware of a duty that one has and there's no time for um, mucking around, as Lemba would say. <laughs> yeah. When you learn to not put your reliance on your own self, but to put one's reliance on other sources of strength and authority, that is actually very empowering. I, it's almost like a reverse of some of the kind of modern concepts of individuality and power. It's a fascinating thing, this concept of power, that that a recognition of one's powerlessness can be extremely empowering because you don't have to rely on your own self. There is some other power that you can rely on and tap into which gives you the inspiration, the strength, the, 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 the ability to trust that everything will work out. You just have to take a step, uh, a step forward and be open to the things that you learn along the way. My husband and I, we were um, approached and asked if we would consider leaving New Zealand to go and live in Kiribati. And, you know, where is this place? I didn't know, I didn't know where it was. <laughs> and was um, interested to find that it was just sort of like a little speck in the midst of the blue. Um, and then I realised it was the Gilbert Islands. Oh, okay, yeah, I had heard of the Gilbert Islands. And, uh, and um, my instant reaction was, yeah, because the institution that had approached us with this thought was an institution that we hold in high regard and we trust their processes of decision making, you know, so who am I to question whether or not I'm capable of doing this? They had thought about it, considered that we were capable of making this move, and um, so, yeah, sure, off we go. So off we went. I so much thank the National Administration, the administrative body of the, the Baha'is in New Zealand for approaching us all those years ago. That was 1981 that you were asked. It was just the most wonderful decision to make. And it's the kind of thing that often happens to Baha'is, you know. These things get thrown at you. How about this? Oh, well, why not? Let's try it. Because, you know, you know that there are, there are sources of, of guidance and empowerment and things turn out when you, when you trust. That was 17 glorious year, years of, of learning, really. And the friends that we made and the, the adventures that we had, the, just the joy of working with a bunch of people and being creative and um, building communities and <laughs> educating kids and having our own children there and seeing them grow up and speaking two languages and being able to mix one culture to another freely. Wow, you know, it was fantastic. And, you know, you can't ever leave that. You know, once you've had that experience like that, it, it stays with you. you. You sort of take the things that you learn, you, you take with you. I still keep going back to, to um, Kiribati because of the responsibilities that, that I have on the institution that I serve on now, which is continental based. So I'm able to maintain my relationship with my friends there. I was so, so full of appreciation for my friends here um, agreeing to, to work on this project. It's been, it's been marvellous, a lot of fun, 
you know, we do have a lot of laughs. We also work hard. <laughs> it's been fantastic. I, s I don't want it to end. <laughs> I'm starting to feel sad already because I can see the end. And, um, you know, you get so attached. You get a sense of attachment to what you've done. And it's not just the product, but it's the, the relationships that develop as a result of working together. Uh, it's, it's always there. The friendships deepen and the, the mutual respect for each other's um, gifts. Uh, it's never forgotten. <laughs>